So hi, good evening, everyone. Hello, buonasera, and thank you uh, for being here. And also thanks to the people. I see quite a few people online as well. And thanks, Professor Mao, for being here. I'm Francesca Tarocco, Director of the New Institute Center for Environmental Humanities at Kafuska University of Venice. That's a mouthful, so we've decided to call ourselves niche, which is everything, as you know, that's needed for an organism to be alive. And I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker of our series in fact, new books in environmental humanities that we will run also in collaboration with the MA program in the environmental humanities that we have here at Kafuskari. And we are delighted that the kickoff event indeed tonight uh, is such a great speaker and a friend. Uh, Professor Christoph Mauch is director of the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society, as well as chair in American Culture and Transatlantic, Transatlantic Relations at LMU. He is the author of several monographs and edited volumes, including Nature in German History, 2004, American Environments, Climate, Cultures and Catastrophe, 2012, and this is a very arbitrary choice, and Slow Hope, uh, uh, a really beautiful volume, The Thinking Ecologies of Crisis and Fear, 2019, and he'll be talking about that tonight for us. But he's also talking, you know, bringing two books, in fact, together, also his latest book, and a very beautifully titled, uh, in fact, uh, Planetary Blues, American Environments and Slow Hope for the Future. That's it from me. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you so much. Can I start? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, thank you so much, Francesca. Thank you, Shaul. Uh, we've seen each other on Zoom, but never live. And it's wonderful mm -hmm. to be here live. Uh, it's, it's a horrible time, and it's very difficult to talk about the environment uh, when a war is raging not so far from here. And uh, it seems somehow that this war has sucked up everything, has sucked up. Uh, maybe in 2008, everybody was thinking that the worst crisis is the economic crisis, and then we, uh, we were thinking about the climate crisis as well, then the pandemic came and other war, and it seems to be, well, even when we think it can't get worse, it's getting worse and worse. And uh, to be in Venice is a bit is strange, to be in this sunny, beautiful old city where you would imagine that nothing can ever change. And I, I walked around today, and I, I have to tell you that what I, what I like the most besides all the architecture and the, this stimulating culture here is the fact that you can actually get lost. <laughs> can, I love to get lost. I don't, have a, I don't have a cell phone. And when you walk around here, you never know where you are and uh, ending up. And uh, if, during the pandemic, I, I also experienced that feeling of loss because I decided I live south of Munich. I realized that uh, all the people from the city are coming to the countryside and they are taking over the space where I'm normally alone. And I decided to explore and go beyond and uh, getting lost is one of, was one of the great things when you don't know where you are and you, have to, you find yourself in the end. It's also almost, it's almost a part of the topic that I will be talking about because in America where I lived for a long time, uh, you can't really get lost in Washington DC. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I lived on uh, First Street and C, you know, A, B, C, and one, two, three, uh, East, South, West. Uh, and I mean, that's almost part of my uh, uh, talk today. I, uh, I have to apologize. You know, Germans always start with an apology, you know, that uh, <laughs> Americans start with a joke. I don't know what Italians start with, start with, but I have to apologize because I was asked first to talk about my new book, and the book is called Planetary Blues. Uh, and I thought, I thought, uh, when Francesca said, talk about your book, she would be talking about planetary blues because it came out on the day when she asked me, but she, of course, didn't know that. Uh, and so, uh, she thought I was talking about slow hope. And I, then we decided talking to Shaul and Francesca that I would talk about both books. So this title, planetary blues, is not a title of a book. It's a mix of planetary, of, 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 uh, paradise blues and slow hope. Slow Hope is a think piece, and um, Paradise Blues is an environmental history of the United States. And um, now I have to find a way to move this forward. Okay, here you've got both of them. And so this is really a compromise, uh, which reminds me of one of the great uh, 
poets and essayists in the early, about 200 years ago in America, uh, he said that a, a compromise, well, this is uh, James Russell Lovell. Uh, he's, uh, he said, uh, James Russell Lowell said, a compromise is something like an umbrella. It's not a roof. So what you're getting today, nobody else will ever get. I'm talking about two books. I can put an umbrella up, <laughs> but it's not a permanent structure. You don't want to talk about this together. They, they're, they're speaking a little bit to each other, but mostly perhaps because uh, both of them are very dear to me. One because it's a think piece and the other one because it's a personal story. So it's I'm actually traveling through America in this book, Paradise Blues. And blues is a very personal music. It's also it was personal music for me. I used to be a church organist at the same time, a blues pianist a long time ago. And so in a way, this book speaks to my own life in a way. And every place that I visited and described in this, I'm not an ethnologist, not an anthropologist, but I work a little bit like an anthropologist in this book. Every place I visited, and many of them I visited multiple times to understand them. So um, after the talk, um, I'm going to throw the umbrella away. You only need umbrellas for certain periods. And then uh, I can also talk about things that are maybe more interesting than these books, uh, about what the Carson Center is doing, uh, where we have 19 uh, research projects that are externally funded and a lot of fellows and a lot of exciting research. But these are the things that I'm going to talk about today. Oops. Now I really need to... Ah, here we go. Now I understand it. So I've talked about slow hope before. In fact, it was probably five years ago when I gave a talk about sustainability somewhere in America, in Seattle. And I thought I had talked about sustainability and somebody told me the next day, a few people said, oh, this great talk about slow hope. I didn't even realize that I had I used that term, but it seemed to be a term that resonated because in a time uh, when we realized that uh, the environment is being destroyed when we, with climate crisis and, and uh, ecological crises. Uh, the one thing that is missing is uh, something that helps us go beyond alarmism. And, um, and it's something that it doesn't happen abruptly. And so it seemed this concept of slow hope that I then developed in this little book uh, seemed to resonate. And um, you all know and can, can think of... Uh, ecological destruction. Maybe in in Venice, it's not unprecedented. This image of Venice in 2000, November 2029 could be an image in 2019. It could be any time. I just probably it wasn't even 2029, just stole it from the internet. So I have to quickly move on. But uh, if you look at Germany 2021, this was enormous. I mean, this was uh, hundreds of people died uh, all of a sudden. So the climate crisis came to areas where you would not never have imagined that they would that it would happen. Turkey 2021, enormous wildfires. Uh, you don't have to go to Australia or, or to California for these disasters, for these unprecedented disasters. You can go to Paris, the Loire uh, Valley. You could go to France, uh, where, that, where a valley looks like, uh, that used to be wet, looks like uh, a desert. So what I find interesting is the fact that we now realize how vulnerable we are. We realize more than ever before how vulnerable we are because of the risks that we took. And for me, the figure that symbolizes that is, I think antiquity has provided us with wonderful figures that can explain complex things, myths that can explain complex things in just one figure. And for me, the, the one figure that uh, brings into, uh, that brings out uh, the connection between vulnerability and risk is Prometheus. Prometheus is the guy who stole fire from the gods. And when he stole fire, he did something that helped. Just imagine what fire meant for human humankind. We would have not been able to live in Central Europe or in Asia because it's too cold. Without fire, we would have had to eat as humans. We would have had to eat insects and leaves uh, and uh, not animals. We can question whether it's good to eat animals, but we uh, the, People wouldn't have lived all over the globe without fire. So fire gives us comfort, fire gives us heat, gives us warmth, makes it possible to, to live on the whole globe. It was a risk to work with fire because fire is also destructive, but um, it, it, uh, it gave us comfort. So we fell in a way in an ecological trap. And um, Prometheus is here, the guy who is a hero because he stole fire on this image. 
And here he is the guy who has to suffer for it. And I think this is the image for us today. On one hand, we have been able to make our planet comfortable through all sorts of things. We've got cars that take us anywhere. Um, we uh, eat whatever we want. We change the environment to, for our needs, make our world comfortable, but we are suffering. We realize that. So Prometheus was um, an eagle came every day during the day, ate his liver, and at night it grew again. So it, it's a painful, painful exercise. And Prometheus combines risk and vulnerability like no other figure in history. What have we done to the planet? Um, we have changed the planet dramatically. This figure shows you, uh, it's a little bit distorted, but uh, it shows you uh, almost 50% of the planet, um, actually uh, is uh, less than 50% of the planet is left untouched. But when I say untouched, it doesn't mean that it hasn't been changed. Uh, climate change is everywhere in the deepest sea, in the Mariana ditch, in the highest mountain. You know, we've, we've got, uh, even going up Mount Everest, people, uh, are, uh, in, uh, in the, standing in a the line these days. But look at the two green circles. Pasture land. This is the size of the continent of Africa. Um, about 40% of the planet, uh, are pasture land or cropland. The smaller green circle, is the size is um, is this cropland, so where we grow wheat and uh, whatever, and also corn, beans, etc., or lettuce or whatever you will. But that is the size of South America. And the other part on the right, where you see all these circles, that's urban land, but we it's also eroded land. It's it's uh, forest that we, we we manage. So that's the size of Australia and Europe together. So the rest of the planet is seemingly unchanged, but could we even live there? Much of it are mountains, much of it are deserts, really high up mountains where you couldn't live anyway, or much of it is uh, the Arctic. Um, so we have changed the planet dramatically. One of the things where I really think where we should be going with our research is soil, because um, I, I've, I've said for years now that we should earthicize our sciences, uh, or the humanities. Earth and size, me, is one of the, uh, one of the, uh, and by earth and size, I mean something slightly more complex than it sounds at the beginning. I think we should focus on the earth as a whole, but we should also focus on the earth, the soil down there. So, uh, I find it shocking how much, um, soil topsoil we've lost within the last 150 years. We need topsoil. You can see it on this image. In the subsoil, you can't plant anything. And it takes hundreds of years for the topsoil or the humus to grow, but it takes a very short time for us to consume it. Do you know how much, anybody has an idea how much we've used up in percent in the last 150 years? Give me any figure. I'll be telling you. 80. 80. That's a high figure. <laughs> <laughs> We probably mean that in 10 years there would be no tops on it, but it's uh, 50%. Um, and I'm, I'm intrigued by the whole uh, microbial world, by the world of bacteria, minerals, looking at the biology of the, of, of the earth, of the, of the soil. Um, I was shocked to read recently that within 10 years in Germany, between 2006 and 2016, uh, more than 40% of the earthworms were decimated. Uh, earthworms are so important to make the make the soil livable. So uh, and they were decimated because they don't have the hedges, they don't have the uh, clover, they don't have the sort of vegetation that they need to survive. But also because they were paralyzed through chemicals, so they can't move anymore. To me, this is one of the most shocking things, and I I urge everybody who moves into research in the environment humanities also to think about soil as an area. I mean, as an environmental historian, I always say we have to walk in the earth. We have to make our shoes dirty. Uh, and uh, understanding where we are walking on is so important because where we're walking on is what makes us, you know, makes us, uh, is, is our livelihood. Without it, uh, we can't live. So focusing on the natural environment is so important. Um, we've changed, modified the animals. I could go into each of them. 
look at what an original chicken looked like. The original chicken didn't lay 250 eggs a year. It didn't uh, look at what uh, pigs looked like or what sheep looked like. We have changed them over the centuries so that they work for us, that they are animals that we consume, either their wool or their milk or their meat, totally, or their eggs, totally. We have changed not just the land, use it up, but also the fauna. And if you go back in history, um, if let's say go back 500 years, go back a thousand years, the weight of wild animals was really, really high in comparison to farm animals and in comparison to uh, animals that are in ourselves, to humans. If you count humans and farm animals together, that would be relatively light a thousand years ago in comparison to the wild animals, zebras, rhinoceroses, lions, elephants. But now it has changed like this. So 95% of the creature of the mammals, of the, of the vertebrates, of the large vertebrates on this earth are humans and farm animals. We've changed everything around us. This is not the planet that we lived on some time ago. So uh, more than 75% of our food comes from 12 plants and five animals. This leads to, in, to, to monocultures. And uh, I'm really shocked by this uh, image. Every major revolution in the history of humankind led to a rise of the global population. You see the orange um, curve. That's the curve of extinction of animals and creatures, uh, species extinction. And uh, you see that the, the blue line is human, the human population. And you can see that uh, we are soon at a point, you know, where the where the orange line meets the, the blue line. And uh, it's not just parallel. It's not just that when we become more humans on Earth, we are extinguishing in the same, relatively the same amount of species. But the curve of species extinction is so steep, it's almost vertical in this diagram. So this all must make us scary. Think of the land use. Think of the change of animals. Think of the extinction of animals. This is what we've done. And I, uh, where is there hope? I mean, can there be any hope? We have to do something about these curves. We have to flatten those curves. The term Anthropocene was not a term that was commonplace a few years ago. And I remember at the Race Carson Center, we had a, a meeting with our fellows. and We had money to do a big exhibition at the Deutsches Museum. And um, we asked the fellows for three days in a castle. We put them all together in a fortress, and they had to come up with a topic uh, for a big exhibition. They could have done anything. We talked about natural catastrophes, but they came up with the term Anthropocene. And the reason was that um, under the umbrella of the Anthropocene, you can actually uh, discuss all sorts of things. Uh, geologists can discuss it. Ecologists can discuss it literature people, philosophers, etc. So this was a term that appealed to everybody. I remember the director general of the Deutsche Museum said, well, this is not a good term. Nobody knows it. And it's true. They did a survey. This was about eight years ago. 90% of people had never heard the term before. And it turned out that most of the people who were really knowledgeable came from the, who they interviewed came from the Carson Center. So this was a, no, a term that we didn't think very much, but today it's uh, everybody knows that we have changed the planet through plastic and concrete, or in this picture, this geometric landscape uh, in, in America where you're building, where you're building into, into the ocean. And so the invention, in my opinion, of the Anthropocene uh, is a mirror of the collective views of humans. We invented it because we realized that we did something to the environment, something dramatic to the environment. Um, and so um, these are the fears. You know them all, the fear of, um, well, no more electricity, the fear of droughts, the fear of flooding, the fear of smog, this is Beijing, the fear of pollution, and uh, etc. So, what this is this is actually the most important thing so far. What I'm what I'm trying to tell you is, it seems paradoxical, but it's true that we fear both our own power and our powerlessness vis-à-vis -vis our own power. So, we realize, like Prometheus, that. What we, what we have done is dangerous for us. 
and we are afraid because we can't do anything about it. So we've we've called, we've opened Pandora's box, if you will, and we can't get the ghost back in, like in this image of the fire. Um, I really like the concept that many of you will know from the eco-critic in Princeton, uh, Rob Nixon, who explains that what we do uh, in the Northern uh, Hemisphere, for instance, when we export uh, e-waste, uh, will have an enormous impact elsewhere. And it's a, it's a violence without weapons. It's a violence because it's sipping through that the toxics uh, end up in Africa. Um, and uh, you probably know this concept. And for me, this was an inspiration to uh, to think about slow violence in, collabor in correlation with slow hope. Uh, there's violence that you cannot see, and hope is also something you cannot see, but it's something that won't happen from one day to the other. Uh, but we have to be really alert. I'm saying you have to be, we have to identify slow hope. We also have to identify slow violence. And we have to think them together. So we can, it's, it's ridiculous to be uh, like naive and think that there is an easy solution to our destruction. But it's also really dangerous not to, and it's really dangerous not to, uh, I think, not to have hope, not to find ideas that can pull us out of the situation. So um, this is another image that shows what we are actually doing to our planet. When we, I don't know, we don't even know where the cars from Germany, you know, we have German, we are producing many cars, we put them somewhere else, and then we buy clean cars, we think we're doing something for the environment, we don't even know where they end up. I try to figure that out, it's, it's, there's no trace where they actually all go and what they do elsewhere. And what we're doing, we just put our head in the sand. Um, acceleration is a marker of our time, and this table, a few uh, years ago, uh, people would have been astonished. Now you don't find this so amazing anymore that, uh, you know, the uh, extinction curve is going up, the pollution is going up, uh, McDonald's are rising, uh, paper production is going up, flooding is going up, uh, catastrophes all over the world are going up. You see this curve that you saw before with the extinction curve and the demographic curve. You see a similar curve, the so-called hockey uh, is climate change, hockey, uh, how do you call it, hockey uh, yeah. curve? Yeah, yeah hockey stick, mm -hmm. hockey stick curve. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see that with everything, you see it with, with climate change and everything. And uh, so the idea is to find ways to flatten this curve, at least to, to make it less steep and then ideally to bring it down. And somehow we have to find ways to get this done. And uh, I think, Slow hope is one of them. But before I talk about that, let me give you one other example of how we have accelerated, our, um, how speed has played a role, especially since industrialization, since the 19th century. The Rhine River was shortened, I think, by 68 kilometers in order to have a canal instead of a river, like on the left. Uh, so the, the, uh, for economic reasons, we make the boats go faster. But the other, um, if you look at the uh, transportation, if you read, I don't know, some of you may know Shiva Bush's book about the railway journey. It's a wonderful book. And he describes how people in the 19th century are for the first time sitting on a train. And they see how the landscape is passing like they're scared because before that they were walking or being on a horseback. But all of a sudden the train is going 50 kilometers and they are so scared because it's so fast. Today, we're 100 times faster than what we have, the vehicles that we're producing with the rockets. And the same is true of Hartmut Rosa, one of the great German sociologists who works on acceleration and resonance as a counter concept. Um, he says, he reminds us, he's actually also a music expert. Uh, in the 1920s, jazz music was uh, something that we thought was the music of nervosity. It was, you know, it was something with a syncopes, something really, uh, you know, made you nervous because it was so fast and uh, mind-bogglingly fast. But today, jazz music is something for a leisurely uh, mm -hmm. Sunday afternoon and you will fall asleep when you listen to Louis Armstrong. Uh, this is not uh, Central Europe, it's actually my brother's place in Montevideo, but uh, I'm, I, I find it uh, shocking to see how many objects we possess today. We needed very few in the Middle Ages, we did have plates, maybe not even a table. They needed maybe some instruments for agriculture. Uh, but uh, maybe in 1500, we needed about 30 objects. 
In 1900, we needed 400. And today, this is a shocking thing. We, in Central Europe, about 15,000. Actually, in Germany, it's more than 21,000 objects that an average uh, German household owns. You know, books and watches and cutlery and um, fashion, uh, shoes. Uh, it's We just buy so much stuff. Does it help us? Does it make our life better? We have, uh, we have this, uh, we have a limited amount of time. Maybe in the Middle Ages, we had, we were living half as long. So, uh, <laughs> it, but, you know, uh, buying a lot of stuff, buying 20,000 things or yeah, buying thousands of things in your lifetime takes a lot of time just to buy it and to sell it or to get rid of it, to waste it. I think this is, uh, something where we realize we have to, we can actually, we should slow down. So slow hope is connected also to slowing down. We need to slow down in all the flatten all the curves that I've shown you. We need to change. We need both stories of slow violence and ecologies of slow hope. But where would that hope come from? You know the story of Prometheus, how it ended. I think it was Zeus. Uh, anyways, there was somebody with a bow and arrow, uh, with an arrow that killed the eagle. And um then the suffering was over, but I don't see anybody. There are many people who tell us, oh, yeah, you just uh, maybe one day we'll fly to Mars and uh, maybe our civilization will end up somewhere else. Or maybe, um, I don't know, uh, we can change the climate by uh, sucking CO2 out of the air. Or we have all sorts of ideas, technological ideas that may change things. But the reality is there's no God there's not one solution. So what I'm saying and what, why the humanities are so important, we have to think very, very broadly. We have to think culturally. We have to think in terms of uh, a wide variety of factors that could help us slow down, help us against consumerism, help us against uh, extinction, help us against manipulating nature for our needs, finding alternatives. And I'm appealing to you to think about that. So I'm giving you just a few examples, but um, I think it's much more important that everybody thinks about it in their own context. So one of the, this is what we need. We need to flatten the curve. That's, it's good to have that in your, in your mind to know what we need to do. Uh, I came up with the term slow hope maybe five or six years ago when I was invited to Taipei. And I, I met this incredible guy called uh, Tsai Jen Hui. He's an architect, and you can see on the right, the uh, image is a view from his treehouse on campus of a technical university. So uh, on the left is uh, the former wall of the university. It used to be a wall, and he replaced the wall with uh, trees, and he opened a, a, a canal or a, a little brook. Um, so you have to go across a bridge, very Venetian, uh, to enter the university, and you see that there's a lot of biodiversity now. And um, this guy, Tsai Jinhui, said to me, after 40 years, he has totally failed. I've done nothing. I've not achieved anything. Uh, even though his campus had changed dramatically, you know, there were tree houses, there were... Uh, there were a lot of animals all of a sudden. There were birds that had never been there. It's in the middle of the city, the biggest street in Taipei. And I told him, hey, don't you realize what you've done in 40 years? He said, yeah, but I haven't changed the city. I've only changed a little bit on the campus and trees are still cut down. I said, no, look what you've done in 40 years. So this is where I thought you have, you have to think in different temporal dimensions. As a historian, uh, things don't happen over uh, from one day to the other. Politicians always say, you know, we have to think, we have to do things right away. Things have to happen all of a sudden. But he triggered me to realize that we have to think in longer terms uh, and that hope doesn't come overnight. And there may be hope that we don't see ourselves. So we should think along those lines. Uh, one of our fellows, former fellows alumna, uh, Ellie uh, Kelsey, she was instrumental in writing, actually during the Bush administration, the young Bush 2009, she was able to write a piece of legislation that established the first national monument in the ocean, very close to the Mariana Ditch, to the uh, deepest place on, on the, in the Pacific. And there was uh, 95,000 square kilometers, uh, and that was preserved. And since then, we've seen uh, 14 uh, national monuments that are larger than that. We know fish are becoming extinct. We are totally, we are, the oceans are full of plastic, but they are also signs of hope. For instance, when you look at octopodes, they, if you leave them alone for three months, 
they will multiply again. So it's a question of what you do, uh, leaving uh, some of the areas of the ocean alone, doing rotational fishing, uh, being using different instruments that are not as uh, uh, destructive. For instance, when you do uh, uh, oysters, uh, or not oysters, but uh, lobsters, for instance, in Maine, you can use devices that will not decimate the population. So uh, sufficiency is one of the principles that I think needs to be absolutely discussed. We have not really thought enough about sufficiency. In order to flatten the curve, uh, I don't, I, I mean, it's very different from sustainability. It's very different from efficiency. Everybody wants to make things more efficient, you know. Okay, our engines will use uh, less gas and will have less pollution, etc. But efficiency is actually dangerous. Technology is trying to focus very much on efficiency, but I think we should look at sufficiency and uh, what is sufficient. And um, one of the great uh, scholars who was at the Castle Center, Tom Princeton, he's a political scientist. He has written a book called The Logic of Sufficiency, and he uh, he emphasizes how important it is to uh, think in terms of sufficiency as knowing that you could do more, but focusing on less in order to have a better life. And I think that's exactly what we need to do. I think that's where hope can come from. Knowing that you could do more, but you don't do it all. So you wouldn't fish for every lobster. You wouldn't use the devices that give you as many as possible, but it will sustain the community over centuries. And the good life is in the center. One of my colleagues um, in Rommel Australia, Hans Brüggemeyer, grew up here. And when he was little, he wrote, I, I never imagined that this river, Emscher, in the Ruhr, the most industrialized area in Central Europe, in the Ruhr area, this river could ever be a river. It's a, it's a, it's a toxic ditch. And uh, when I was little, I thought I could maybe one day fly to the Mars. But now this river looks like this. And probably in 20, 30 years, you will be able to drink the water. So we've been able to renaturalize uh, areas. In Munich, there's an ESA renaturalization. I could talk much about it. I, I think it's also important just in brackets, and you will do this in Venice, uh, to look at the environments in which you live. Understanding the environments in which you live is not only rewarding, because, uh, but it, it's so eye-opening. And uh, so with my students, I've done um, multiple projects, including one called Ecopolis Munich, where we are trying to understand uh, how... Um, yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, how, how uh, Munich actually comes out of, out of the river. There would have been no city without the river. There would have been no city without the Alps being close by, without wood coming to the city, charcoal being produced there. Uh, and uh, there would have been no beer, actually, because you needed, you needed the cooling uh, ice from the Alps. You needed the geology, the glacial geology of uh, gravel. So you can... And Venice is even more of an open book to read, but I, I think it's important to understand the areas where you are living in. And um, so there has there's hope in even in Munich, uh, where we've renaturalized. There are other problems coming up because now everybody loves it so much. We're loving it to death because everybody has parties at the Isa River. Um, here, I can skip over this. You know what the taste of London is like, like. Uh, the pea supers and uh, Charles Dickens is writing about. We thought that all these thrillers, that it was fog, but it was all smog. And today uh, there had been legislation after many people died at one incident in the 50s. Snow, slow food, I didn't have to explain that to an Italian audience, but I find it fascinating how uh, Carlo Pedrini in, in Piedmont was able to uh, help revitalize an area that had been a remote area, peripheralized area with a lot of violence, with a lot of poverty, by understanding that there's something that people had, had ignored, the resources of the area. And uh, so slow food versus fast food is one way of giving slow hope. And now there are 160 countries in the world where slow food movements exist. Cradle to cradle, uh, my friend Michael Braungart is actually a chemist. He worked together with an uh, architect on a book, Cradle to Cradle. And the idea is to uh, look at nature and the cycle of nature and try to replicate it. I mean, a tree, uh, the leaves are falling down and then they're used by the tree to get nutrition again into the trunk. And uh, the idea is to do the same thing with industrial products. I, to some extent, it works. I mean, there are now even edible 
Lufthansa seats and uh, like these ones in the first class. I mean, I've never tried it. I've never been in first class. But uh, uh, anyways, uh, I think the idea of uh, producing in a circular way, imitating uh, nature in production is one way to slow down the use and the abuse and the uh, pollution of our environment. But then, land, then language is extremely important. Tom Princeton is somebody who, again, uh, is emphasizes that it's important to say that we're ending the fossil fuel era, ending the fossil fuel era. If you say you're ending, you are, I mean, this is a curve that is uh, going down. I think uh, whatever, I mean, you can see this with Donald Trump or in the, in the world out there, um, arguments used to be strong. You used to, I mean, Habermas would have said, you know, a better argument wins. Uh, couple of decades ago. But today we see that arguments don't count anymore with the social media and uh, they just they counter arguments and arguments. But I think it's uh, one of the great uh, uh, philosophers of language, Richard Rorty, once said that uh, it's important, arguments are not as important as the way we talk. The way we talk about things is more important than the actual argument. And um, I think it's important, for instance, to talk about ending the fossil fuel era, and almost always talking about it. I also think, as humanity scholars, this is our chance. This is our chance to emphasize, uh, because we are good in telling stories. I think that uh, narratives are important. The way we tell stories, that's a big difference to natural scientists uh, who deal with empirical data. We, as historians, as literary scholars, as uh, anthropologists, we can convey stories uh, in a way that others can't. And these stories are important if you want to create slow hope. Um, there is even a country that will soon be CO2 neutral, Costa Rica. There are reasons for that. It's, uh, but um, for me, one of the, this is the last example before I move to my other book. Uh, one of the most fascinating things I used to, I started one little book with, with uh, Venice uh, because Venice uh, basically invented sustainability uh, in uh, the late Middle Ages when they were able to um, to have enough wood for the Arsenal because because uh, the Arsenal uh, needed wood for the big ships, they needed certain types of wood, different ones for the rows, different ones for the body, and they were for the first time thinking about uh, not only space, setting about space for woods, but also time. How long will it take to grow for these trees to grow? Which trees will grow? And so they did this. And they, Venice didn't, as you all know, didn't go under because of uh, lack of wood. It went under because of Napoleon. So uh, I find it interesting how we used to think about wood, but it was economic thinking. It was actually, it served the military and it was economic thinking. Today, we think about wood in a very different way. Uh, we know that trees are creatures. We know that they are feeding each, that roots are feeding each other. We understand uh, that there's chemical processes. Uh, I mean, mushrooms are much closer to humans than, than trees, but we understand that there's something that connects us as humans with the more than human world. And the more than human world is something that we really need to understand and integrate in the environmental humanities more. So now, um, my, this is the last example of this project and the first one of the other one. I end my book, Paradise Blues, on a positive note. For the same reason that I talk about slow hope, I end it with a city that is totally, totally polluted through DDT. The Kaiser shipyards in Portland, Oregon have totally polluted the Willamette River. And today it's the most sustainable city, the one with the most bicycles. The head of the sustainability office is above the head of the city planning office. It's the only city that I, big city that I know where this is the case. And I was intrigued to understand how this change happened. So my last chapter of the book, Travels into America's Nature and History, uh, is actually located in Portland, where I went three times to understand what happened. And it's very complex. It does, you can't just dictate it. But uh, there's a mix of uh, grassroots understanding its identities play a role, even literature plays a role. Um, so um, I will now move to this. Uh, this is uh, actually taken from uh, on, the, on the way to Alaska to a place. My, in the, the first chapter is on Alaska, my book. 
And it's a mix of travel reporting, environmental history, and nature writing. Environmental history, I'm trying to be a real academic here, but uh, with nature writing, as you know, it's a genre that in the Anglo-American tradition, it's much stronger than elsewhere, uh, but it's something that is subjective. You go into and try to understand whether it's fiction or non-fiction. In my case, it's non-fiction, but you try to understand, you read nature. And uh, it's, it's uh, for me, it was important to not just look at the documents that we normally look at, but also, let's say, at a tree in Malibu, California, where I was wondering, I stand in front of the tree and I wonder, it's January, why is this tree blooming in January? And I realized it comes from South Africa. Why did it come from South Africa? Because we modified uh, the environment, wanted it to look like South Africa. Somebody thought this exotic tree needed to be moved. So reading these natural documents was important and describing them. So I'm trying in this book to combine three genres that are normally never combined. Travel writing, or it's almost a travel guidebook, but not to the locations that you would normally see, not to New York City or San Francisco or New Orleans, but to other places that are eye-opening. Um, and a mixture of environmental history. So I'm trying to be at, at the top of where current research is, and at the same time have this subjective, because I like this genre, the, the uh, nature writing genre. And I have to say that originally I wanted to write a different book. It's always the same thing. When you write a book, mm -hmm. you start, then, uh, and then I came up with this book, and now I would, don't like it anymore. I would, this is why it's good to take off the umbrella later on. I would write a totally different book. But in the beginning, my idea was to write a book, uh, a national history of the United States, and I knew exactly what it looked like. I had a great idea. I thought I knew exactly because I'm, I'm European. I lived in America for 15 years. I saw the differences. I thought it's weird. Americans are so wasteful on one hand, and they are also uh, great because they protected the environment like nobody else. They've got wilderness areas. They're the inventors of national parks. They've explored the national parks everywhere. And I came up with a solution. I realized why this is the case because they had so much land. I mean, if you ignore the Native Americans, which they, but they settled the land. They moved from east to west. As soon as they got rid of, as soon as they, uh, as soon as the territory eroded when they planted tobacco or corn, they just moved further to west. They had all the land in the world, so they became wasteful. Uh, cities looked different because, uh, you know, they were just people were just planting themselves wherever they could, and um, so. Uh, that explained, to, to, in my opinion, why Americans were so wasteful. They were long distances, so no wonder they have more CO2. Uh, they can waste uh, land. They don't. In Germany, you need to, in Italy, you have uh, incinerators. In America, you have dumps because you just have a lot of spaces dumping somewhere. So I had this, I knew this is it. Some people had called America nature's nation. And then I realized this is all wrong. There's something totally wrong about this understanding. And I realized that when I went to Colorado. It was an eye-opening day. I, I went to a place called Dinosaur. Here is the weirdest place. I had not, I didn't have a travel guidebook. I had no idea where I would end up. I went to Dinosaur, and every street in that place had a name, a dinosaur name. The place was called Dinosaur, and the uh, you know, T-Rex and uh, Brontosaurus. I don't know whether you've, any of you has been there. And I realized in 1901, somebody had found dinosaur bones. And after that, the whole city became, uh, the whole, they, they started a, a town and they called it Dinosaur. And it's got a huge museum. You can see dinosaur bones and a lot of dinosaur uh, uh, plastic stuff. And the whole city was called. And then I went to the next place. The next village was called Rangeley. Rangeley had about five or 6,000 inhabitants. Everybody in Rangeley worked for Chevron and there were pumps and it looked like a moon landscape. So it's this first picture here. Everything was, actually, this looks much more green than when I was there. It looked really like a desert. And there was one pump next to the, next to the other, the largest oil field, just totally destroying. The, you didn't want to live there. As, I went to a restaurant. It was horrible. The next place over, and I'm not kidding. This is just one place next to the other. So oil had been discovered in 1901 in Rangeley. And in 1901, Teddy Roosevelt went to the next place called Meeker. And in Meeker... He loved the area so much. You know, Teddy Roosevelt started some of the national parks. He started a national forest because he loved to hunt there. There were mountain lions. He wanted to hunt mountain lions. And I stayed in the Grand Hotel where Teddy Roosevelt was staying. A huge hotel. Didn't change since 1901. He was there in 1901. But bones were found. Oil was found. Teddy Roosevelt finds mountain lions. 
and everything would have looked the same 150 years ago. But all of a sudden, within a very short time, because of our perception, because of the way we look differently at these different natures, we have transformed it entirely. And I realized, shoot, if I want to understand America and I focus on politics and on East-West movements, on Washington, whatever has been done there, I cannot never understand these localities and the specifics of the local. And so I realized if I write an environmental history of America, places are important. Understanding places, zooming into a place, zooming out. And I realized you have to look at the long durée. I mean, it's obvious with the oil. How long did it take? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years for the oil to be produced. How long does it take to pull it out? A hundred years, maybe less in the case of Chevron. Looking at the long durée, looking at the geology, like in the case of the Alps in Munich, looking at geology uh, with natural disasters uh, in on the West Coast, let's say, in America, looking at the geology here, um, all this is extremely important. So I'm reading documents of culture, and by documents of culture, I mean everything, not just literature. I'm talking about statistics. I'm talking about political documents. I'm talking about um, everything that is not nature. I'm looking at documents of culture, but also documents of nature. So that's my approach in this book. Uh, Paradise Blues. I also did oral history. This happens to be in Malibu. In Malibu, I was lucky enough to uh, go to Barbara Streisand's uh, compound. I'm one of the few people I've been in all five houses of Barbara Streisand uh, uh, <laughs> after she moved out to another place, um, which she tried to... No, it's, it's an interesting story. Anyways, uh, what I wanted to say, in, in a place like that, I would have talked to, because there's uh, wildfires, so I would talk to uh, this is a Native American who at least styles himself as such, and he's rebuilding the types of uh, buildings that you, the Native Americans, too much Natives, uh, use. But I would talk to firefighters, I would talk to people who have an eco uh, garage and, and uh, you know, with huge cars in front of it. Uh, what is this? You know, um, in Malibu, you, you, you can meet uh, Jennifer Aniston and, and, uh, I mean, she wouldn't talk to you uh, right away, but I, I spent, I went to Malibu three times and tried to understand something about uh, the culture there, people who are claiming to be ecologists and are using up the environment. I was intrigued by that. I was also intrigued in Malibu about the wildfires, the uh, erosion that is totally taking off the beach. Why are these people doing this? Why are people living in areas that are disaster prone? If you look at the United States, Florida, Texas, South Carolina, at the beach, most of the uh, uh, people, most of the growth of the African population happens in places that are most disaster prone, where the most hurricanes happen, because they love to be close to the coast. So disasters are not natural, they are unnatural, because we decide to live in areas that are disaster prone. Sorry. In order to understand that, I want to know why are people living there? What was it like before? Too much vegetation, for instance. So, but oral history was important. And I, wherever I went, I would talk to people like this guy. Uh, and I selected eight sites. Originally, I wanted to select 10 sites, but then COVID came. And anyway, it took me ages. I don't even, can't even tell you how long it took me to write this book. How long it took me to find these places because each time I found a place, I realized it doesn't really, cannot tell the story properly. So I needed to, it was really important for me to find places that tell the story properly. So you can see here on the very uh, northwest, Wiseman is a place with 30 inhabitants uh, in the very southeast. Uh, I was intrigued to go into the tropics, into an area, the only one on Earth, by the way, where you have alligators and crocodiles, crocodiles coming from the south, alligators from the north. But I looked at Disney World. I thought Disney World would be totally interesting because it's so American and it also deals with nature. So I looked at uh, Niagara Falls, uh, Memphis, Tennessee. I looked at Memphis because I realized you cannot write about America without having a city on the Mississippi. The Mississippi is such an important place. The river has defined in many ways the country. Anyway, it cut that country in half. Everything west of the Mississippi has no wood and has no water. Everything east of the Mississippi has wood, water, and land. West of the Mississippi only have land. If you want to understand why indigenous people live in adobe places on the west, you have to understand that there is no wood. So understanding a nation, understanding places through the environment was really important. But the Mississippi, you know, um, 
I chose that place also because of slavery, because of plantations, um, because I was intrigued by the question of, I knew I had to talk about environmental justice. And you can see it everywhere about environmental injustice, one of the big topics. I can't write about America without understanding, for instance, going to Florida, where they burn the sugar in the wintertime and uh, in the fall, and they burn the sugar leaves exactly when the wind turns to the African-American quarters. And uh, the Sierra Club has found out about it, and now they are suing the sugar planters. So I'm looking at uh, I'm looking at these places. I've selected them deliberately to. Um, oops, sorry. I chose places that are ambivalent. For instance, uh, Niagara Falls. Everybody knows it, but I chose a place next to it. Love Canal, the, big, the, the disaster, the biggest disaster in the history, toxic disaster, right next to Niagara Falls. And I like this juxtaposition of a place that is, uh, yeah, that is supposedly the most beautiful place that became a national park, became a state park on the Canadian side and on the American side. But what does it mean that you have water there that you use for energy and that all the industry comes up as a result? And what is this industry doing in the backyard of the, of the waterfall? Um, I try to find places that are representative of the region, the humid tropical southwest, the Arctic northeast, the desert, etc. And I will show you a few cases. But I also decided to look at unknown places because uh, otherwise, you know, it's like a tourist guide. You know, you go to all the places that you already know and they, they, you, you look at the sites. And I didn't want that. So I look at places that are totally unknown, but next to places that are known. I'll give you an example in a minute. Las Vegas, I'm not focusing on Las Vegas, but I'm visiting Las Vegas. But I'm actually focusing on St. Thomas. And I bet you that none of you has been to St. Thomas because St. Thomas basically doesn't exist. But I'll tell you in a minute. I'm starting in Alaska in this place with 13 inhabitants. And I decided to go to a place that I could, I needed to have some history. So I found a book by uh, Robert Marshall, who invented the wilderness, uh, was one of the, not the inventor of the wilderness, but he was the person who was the most important in starting the wilderness uh, movement in America and wilderness laws that happened in 1964. Um, and he went to Alaska, he was a rich guy who came from the East Coast, was the first person to fly into, into, uh, into Alaska on a plane. And he uh, loved it so much that he decided to preserve this landscape. And uh, his book called Arctic Village uh, about Wiseman was for me the trigger to go back to Wiseman. There were hundreds of people living in Wiseman when he came because there, there were Native Americans. Actually, they all call themselves Indians and they call themselves Eskimos, so not Inuit. In that place, they call themselves by these names for a number of reasons that I can't go into. So he, he looks at this place with hundreds of people working in this gold place. So they're digging for gold. And I'm intrigued by the fact that Alaska becomes settled only because of gold. And then I'm intrigued by the fact that I can only reach Wiseman by car because there's an oil pipeline that passes it. So next to Wiseman is, oops, so I, so I should, I should tell you, I'm starting in Alaska. That's also important to realize that every history of America starts in the, every European history starts in the East, moving westward. And I think it's a problem because um, it's much more important to look at, if you want to see where America is coming from, if there's an indigenous population. And that's why I'm starting in the place that is most intact. That's why I'm starting in Alaska. So I totally turn it around in my history. Uh, so this is the ultimate uh, contradiction uh, between radical protection because there are wilderness areas in Wiseman. Uh, Robert Marshall was the one who was pursuing this. And there's also risky exploitation. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, it's a it's a question that William Cronin asks, for instance, will we ever save the planet if we if we establish wilderness areas? So I'm using these places to discuss some of the most essential questions. What should our world look like? Setting aside wilderness it will not do it. So enjoying wilderness is one thing. A travel guide would say, enjoy the wilderness. You're all alone, and you know. Um, but I I try to question all these uh, understandings of why we visit certain places. Uh, remoteness. I'm intrigued by remoteness. Anthropologists know a lot about remoteness. They uh, they love to work in remote places. I I find it interesting to see that remote places. That this is one of the places in um, in Wiseman, one of the former gold 
a log cabins and everybody's living in these cabins now. Everybody, the 13 inhabitants uh, are living there. But remoteness, people in these remote areas are obsessed also with being connected to the world. So there's a satellite dish. They have a, a huge monument that's made up of beer tins. They put it, they, they, they fence it in. So you can actually see in this totally remote place where nobody comes and where it's dark for hundreds of days and uh, the sun doesn't uh, uh, set and other, and, and, uh, during the summertime uh, because it's north of the polar circle. But this place is so connected to the world. So each time I zoom into a place, I also try to understand how it's connected to the rest of the world. So the, what is remoteness in the 21st century? I've, I've gone into Weisman uh, and uh, it changed me in many ways. But this is the desert. I, so I look at the desert and uh, I look at St. Thomas and St. Thomas is very close. You can see this on the map to Las Vegas. St. Thomas is big on my map because it's the place I visit. But I also went to Las Vegas and I went to all the surrounding areas, um, including Lake Mead. And I realized that St. Thomas doesn't exist anymore so that Las Vegas can live. Well, that's my story in this chapter. So here is St. Thomas. The only lively place of St. Thomas is on the left. It's a cemetery. Because the cemetery was actually moved on a hill. All the graves were moved up. And St. Thomas had to die when Lake Mead, the dam of the Colorado River, when Lake Mead was created. So people moved out of St. Thomas. I found documents. I found photographs of the last person, an automobile dealer who is going out. Some of the people, the post office, people on a little bit like Venice, they are, on, they are leaving on boats. Um, it's amazing. I found, the, I found the city map. I walked through this area of St. Thomas. I realized, you know, I found the hotel. I found that it was a grand hotel. It was a bigger city than Las Vegas 120 years ago, uh, 110 years ago. And um, it was not unimportant. It was, people were able to live in this area, in the desert, for a long, long time. It was a sustainable existence in the desert under extreme conditions, you know, with 45 degrees centigrade in the summer. But they were able to live, and I'm intrigued by how the indigenous population was living there, how the Mormons were dealing with the water. They were mostly Mormons at that time in the desert. And what, uh, why, why they filled up the lake so they would have, you know, um, this is what it looks like. So they would have enough water and electricity. Uh, but the shocking thing is, this is why it's calling it the ghosts are returning with the water level sinking and the water being used up by California and Colorado. With that sinking, St. Thomas is coming out. And I was the only person in St. Thomas when I walked around, I could hear two coyotes. I was a little bit afraid. I didn't know whether when you hear coyotes, whether they're dangerous or not dangerous. I had read something about it, but I, I realized that now the lake is going away. What does it mean? Um, and uh, then I went to Las Vegas, and Las Vegas is, of course, the ultimate city of abuse of water, and it's absolutely crazy. But I found a counter story as well, actually a story of hope. There is a woman um, originally from Germany who went after the high school to America, Patricia Mulroy. She, she changed the policy of Las Vegas. Now you get money for every piece of lawn that you change from grass to uh, what is called seroscaping. So I'm telling stories like this as well. What is actually happening? How do you how do you deal with uh, a scenario in the desert? So I'm using St. Thomas as a place to focus on what's happening in the desert. And there are weird things happening, really, really weird things. For instance, this. You probably haven't heard of it, and I had no idea about it, but there were missed atomic bomb competitions in Las Vegas. And they are uh, so uh, and there were there were shows. People in the hotels were brought over to picnics to watch uh, nuclear uh, explosions. Some of them were as bad as, uh, as Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And it was only much later when people realized, I mean, the people you can see here, this is the military, they all were contaminated. They were sitting like 20 miles away. But this was a spectacle that people went to, and it became something that Las Vegas sold. They sold the, the, the girls. They, uh, this is actually it was a cover for, for music, uh, um, Miss Atomic Bomb is actually a, um, uh, was actually a, a band, a rock band in America. So there are things happening in the desert that would not happen anywhere else because it's so remote. Also, this is happening. The boneyard. Where do all the planes go when they're gone? They are very close to St. Thomas. Uh, and a place next to it. You would think this is the Near East, but it's a place where soldiers, GIs, American soldiers, you can actually go there as a tourist, but 
you have to register a year in advance and you have a background check. But uh, FDVHR is not a uh, New York City. It's, it's in the desert, not so far from Las Vegas. And people who go to the, who dispatch to the Near East, go to FDVHR and are actually, uh, you know, they are um, here uh, in the desert, uh, adjusted to the climatic conditions uh, and to the customs of the Near East. This is happening in in the, in the desert. It's, and I'm wondering and I'm, I'm struggling with the concepts like uh, Patricia Limerick, who is a historian of the West, landscapes of failure. Is this a landscape of failure? Uh, I'm wondering, you know, a landscape of failure because uh, used, people used to live there and, and it was a success story. They were able to survive with very limited means. Now it's the waste bin of the nation where you have the boneyards where indigenous people have to deal with the nuclear waste. Is this a failed landscape? I'm, of course, intrigued by the Lake Mead and the Hydraulic Society. I mean, you know, which forward's concept of the Hydraulic Society, how uh, is centralized in China, you know, that uh, from China that uh, whoever has power over water has power over the land. Um, and uh, I'm intrigued by the sites of extraction. There are tens of thousands of ghost towns in the American West. So what is left there? Is this part of the landscape of failure? I'm intrigued by the fact that there's militarization next to recreation, very close. It all happens in the desert. It doesn't happen anywhere else. Uh, it happens in these remote areas. And I'm intrigued by the fact that these may be uh, zones that people have deliberately sacrificed. So Washington, you won't read about it these military places. Have you ever heard about them? Probably not. Because they you don't this is not part of our narrative. And I so my stories are really detective stories about places that you would not go to normally, but that open an understanding. And I think this is what we can do as environmental humanities scholars because we can tell stories that are surprising and are revealing. Um, the prairie, so actually this is uh Kansas um it's as flat as a pancake, except pancake is hilly in comparison to you. <laughs> but uh, Dos City, I don't know whether you in Italy saw Gunsmoke. It's a, it's a Western series. In Germany, I was not allowed to watch it as a kid because there were pistols involved. In the <laughs> but uh, it was uh, going on for decades. Uh, and uh, this is the scenery in, you see here at the bottom right, this is uh, Dos City, um, the film, uh, but it's, I mean, it's, Exactly rebuilt from where it was. They built a car park and then they had to <laughs> put the original history one as a museum up for the, and it was just used for the, for the TV series. Uh, you see here a sheriff, actually, he says he's the only real sheriff. And I was wondering why, why I asked him, you know, met him in the beginning and then in the end, why are you wearing, why are you not wearing your sheriff hat today? Why are you wearing a baseball hat? And he said, are you kidding me? This is the windiest city. And that's when I realized, you know, what, what the prairie could be in the future. I think they could easily in Kansas produce 40% of the wind energy for the whole, at least for the whole country. Um, so I'm intrigued by, uh, by what it used to be, the Western town that was created because, uh, they could ship from there longhorn cattle that came from the South, from Texas to Chicago to the meat factories, to the slaughterhouses of Chicago. And so that's where the cowboy myths are coming from. That's where, because they were fighting each other once they, they were driving the longhorn up, they were drinking, they were uh, wasted, and they, there would be fights. And the whole, the story of Dodge City is the story of these cowboy fights. They were not as bad as you might imagine, but they're part of American culture. And I'm trying to understand both American culture and American nature. And for me, one of the, uh, well, here you can see, uh, I, I talked to the guy who owns the feedlot on the bottom right. Uh, his name is Winter. And he asked me, are you a good guy or a bad guy? When I entered this, I didn't, I just walk up to people. I just walk up to them and say, I'm a good guy. I'm not a journalist. I'm a historian. And I, I, I ended up talking to him until, um, well, for a few hours. It was good to talk to him, but later on he realized that they come from the Rage Cost Center, which is a problem. Uh, <laughs> because, um, the meatpacking industry is is horrible. And the way he talked was so interesting. He talked about the semis, the 40-ton trucks that come to the city and the semis, 40-ton trucks that leave the city. 
The semis that come into the city are the cows. The semis that leave the city is the meat. And he prepares the, the animals in his feedlot through feeding them with what he calls cornflakes. They have the right size. It's scientifically measured. So they have exactly the right size for cornflakes. He prepares them so that they, within six months, they can gain 700 pounds and can be slaughtered next door. So next door, they've got the big corn elevators for the cornflakes, the slaughterhouses, and the feedlot. And uh, I have to say, when I when I went to these places, I knew I knew somebody told me, if you want to understand the West, Andrew Eisenberg, historian of the West, told me, if you really want to, I, I had chosen another place before and said, you have to go to Dodge City because there you've got the smell. And it's also important not just to look at the visual. I'm showing you slides now, but in Alaska, I went to Alaska with a painter. And the painter, uh, you would think that he was painting Alaska, but in the contrary, he was actually, he brought an audio with him uh, because he said, my memory is much better when I listen to something. And it's amazing to take a take an audio recorder with you. Uh, even when there's nothing happening in Alaska, there is sound. And when you listen to it later on, it's, I did this when I wrote the chapter. I realized, my goodness, I had forgotten that. So your, uh, our memory is actually better triggered, not by visuals, but by, uh, by audio. And I remember the smell of Dodge City. I can tell you that this is not a good smell. And I think it's important to, when you write about something, to be synesthetic, not just about one sense, not about the visual, but about everything. That's what humanity scholars do, where we can do what scientists can't do. And we should really, really emphasize this. Um, in a way, this is my favorite story because I realized through the, uh, while I was there, but also through uh, a book that Tim McCain wrote about the matter of history, uh, he's a new materialist, that everything I saw in Dodge City, you know, the largest house that was built by a guy who uh, owned cattle. There was a German guy and I was interested in his family and I realized the stone house there only exists because of the cattle that were driven to Dodge City. The ranches that are there in the area can only be there because of the bison that who's done produced the earth over time. But the bisons were all killed. Once the bisons were all killed and the uh, cattle came to Dodge City, the cattle actually helped create the wealth. It was not humans that created the wealth, but the cattle to a large extent. First of all, the cattle bring themselves to the market. They walk. They walk to the market. Which other product, which other good walks itself to the market for free? And also, I realized that the cattle, they have to be wild enough to defend themselves. So these, these longhorn creatures, they can actually survive in the wintertime because they can, with their horns, they can find something under the snow. They can also defend themselves. They can live in the wild. Cattle came from Asia. They came to uh, Europe and to Latin America, and they were domesticized. But by the time they, they uh, came up here, these cattle that brought themselves to the market and ended up as meat in Chicago and today in our city, these cattle co-produced the wealth of the city. And so um, I think it's really important to think of not human history, but of more than human history. You can think of mosquitoes, how mosquitoes were, there would be no American. Mosquito was more important than George Washington uh, in, the, in the Revolutionary War, probably, because I could explain that. But I'm here, I'm, I'm focusing on, uh, on how and I think the Texas Longhorn co-created material wealth of Dodge City. Finally, I think, no, this is almost finally, it's the second from last <clears throat> subtropics. So I wanted to go to Disney World. I was the last visitor of Disney World in 2000, uh, two years ago. Um, I was almost arrested for a reason. <laughs> uh, anyways, I, I, I wanted to go to Disney World, but then I, I was intrigued by the, uh, Everglades National Park. I understood why people created Grand Canyon National Park, Yosemite, Rice Canyon, Mesa Verde, incredible places, even dinosaur. <laughs> but it's difficult to understand that, you know, this, this area that is totally swampy. There's nothing. 
nobody could live there. there were, in the 19th century, uh, one of the founder newspaper article that said it's easier to settle the moon than to ever settle the Everglades. At that time, the Everglades were larger. So I realized only when I went there, and this is why I think autopsy is so important to go to places, that the Everglades have their origins next to Disney World. And there's a lake, and all the water that comes down to what is called um, River of Grass by one of the great journalists and writers of Florida, all the water that comes down actually comes from, you see up, up here in the north, uh, Disney World, there's a little lake just below it, and the whole Everglades National Park at the very southern tip has all its water from there. And I thought, I'm going to Disney World because Disney World is it the absolute opposite of the Everglades? This is what the Everglades looked like. I was in a boat. You can actually, you could, if you stick your finger in the water, you could be, they could be eaten by, by an alligator. It seems really wild. I thought, oh, this is the wildest place. And next to it is the most artificial place. That's what I thought. But I realized this is not true. Yes, the most artificial place is maybe even more artificial than we think. Um, all the water in Disney World is, you know, they, they make it slow all the time, so there are no mosquitoes. They also spray garlic. You don't smell it, so that there are no mosquitoes. So everything's very artificialized. So I'm interested in the environment. Nobody talks about the environment of Disney World, but I was interested, for instance, in this lake. They took the water out for five years because the lake had a dark color, and they wanted it to look blue. So they took all the water out and put new water in and, 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 uh, and made sure that it would look Beautiful. So I thought, okay, this is the ultimate. This is an artificial world, the opposite of the Everglades. But I realized that this is not true. Well, here you see about 4,800 workers remodeling, 80 kilometers dam system, 30 kilometers of dikes, 30 automatic locks. And then you go to Disney World. You can go to Africa and India within a few minutes. It actually takes less than 10 minutes to go from Africa to India in the animal kingdom. And the safari is real, you know. If you don't want to spend money and just have to spend $257 for one day in Disney, in Animal World and the whole Disney, just, you know, 25 for a car to park it. But you can go on a, on a, on a trip and see a real elephant, see a real rhinoceros. You don't have to go to, to Africa. This is how it's marketed. What you don't see, and this was what I was interested in, and they don't tell you in Disney World, they will not tell you any of this, but they are robbers, like the rhinoceros comes to you, and it comes very close to your jeep or whatever, but uh, it cannot cross because it goes really deep down and they camouflage that. Or the anteater, why does the anteater go back and forth in front of you all the time? Because they put the food there. Or the lions, why do the lions come up to the jeep? Because because it's climatized. So I'm interested in this total artificiality, the choreography of nature. And then also in the alternate fake, in the absolute fake, uh, you see this is, uh, what's it called? Avatar, the world of Avatar. You see here on the bottom left, there you cannot distinguish between the real and the, uh, and the artificial nature. The artificial nature is sometimes even more perfect than the real one, and it also reacts to you because it's got senses, it's got, sen it's got sensors in it, so it reacts to you approaching it, uh, it moves, so it's, re it's, it's, it's crazy what you see there. You think, you know, I, all of a sudden you don't know where you are anymore because you, you, you think you're in nature, and then you think you're in culture, and it's, it's blurred totally. It's the absolute fake. Um, or hyper-reality, as Roberto Eco called it. He was not in Disney World, he was in Disneyland, but it's really interesting to read what he says about Disneyland decades ago. But then I realized that the Everglades used to be huge. You see on the left map that uh, the very top, this is where Disney World is, there used to be a sea of grass, all water. And it was diverted in order to have plantations, tree plantations, orange plantations. Of course, oranges didn't exist in America, nor did cows or horses before Columbus. Uh, oranges came later. So you identify Florida with oranges, but of course, they're, they're much later additions. So everything that you identify, the nature identified with Florida is not original. So they have changed the flow of the water so much that the bottom is now the national park. But in order to make sure that this national park has enough water, they had to dig up, you see that on the left picture, 
You had to dig up parts so that uh, some of the highways would have cut off the whole water flow. So then they now dig up, uh, put the highways on top of the um, on top of the land so that the water can flow and that the national park exists. We have changed the environment so much to have this national park and to have water in the national park and alligators and crocodiles. We've changed it so much that I was wondering after this trip, is there a difference between Disney World and the Everglades? You are orchestra, you, you have to walk on certain, you have to walk on boardwalks, just like in Disney World. In Disney World, you, everybody sees the same thing. Exactly the same thing, the same line going back and forth, the same anteater, the same rhinoceros, the same Africa in a train. And here in Everglades, the same thing. You have a boardwalk, you can, you can never go off. You drive your car to a certain point, there's one way through. Uh, you, uh, so everything is artificial. And you really wonder, you know, which world are we living in? And, um, people have tried to change the world, like, um, Sometimes I'm lacking the words. What's it called? The, um, on the right, the, uh, that they got rid of. Mangrove. Mangrove, yeah. Mangrove. You identify beaches, Miami Beach, before. But mostly blacks, African Americans, had to get rid of the mangroves. So there would have been no no sand beaches without without laborers in the 20th century taking off all these mangroves. These mangroves are extremely important for the environment because they work against erosion, but they also work against CO2. I mean, they 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 are they are they can they can um, how do you call it? They can uh, they, they they like a forest. They work like a forest, even better than trees. So they they have they, they can, they can have uh, contain CO2. Or on the left. People realized, okay, we have to drain the landscape. And there was the first forester in America, the first one who got a PhD. He realized, he was in Australia, he realized, okay, if we take Melaleuca on the left, you see this everywhere, you see it on trucks, people are transporting it. I thought, what is happening here? Why is there so much stuff on trucks, so much vegetation? And it looks like this. This vegetation, if you look at it, you see no bird can live there, no bird can nest there because it's too close. These trees are too close. This was introduced in the 1930s by a forester who realized we can drain the landscape by planting melaleuca from, um, from uh, Australia. But the shocking thing is if you plant melaleuca, it will never stop to grow. And so now they're fighting against nature, but nature is winning. And you see all these trucks, I was wondering, you know, I saw these orange trucks in Florida. I saw these melaleuca trucks. I realized, you know, some of the places still have mangroves. And that's what I mean by reading not just documents, but documents of nature, trying to understand. Most of the things that I discovered, I discovered through, you know, but just by asking uh, people, you know, what is it? What's happening? You know, what are these, what are these trucks transporting? And then I did some studies about it. So uh, Disney suggests that the world of the amusement park is magical and enchanted. But my question is, is not all of Florida's nature an invention? Imagined by the Imagineers. Imagineer is a word by Disney. Created by Disney. So, uh, it's a mix of engineer, uh, and, uh, there's a guy who has about 20 earrings. You should talk to him. He's the chief and engineer of, um, uh, he's been to every, every part of the world to, to engineer the landscapes of Disney World. And he says it's a mix of, uh, like a mix of a nuclear power station and a drama. I mean, the way he describes the Disney World is, is crazy. The way he, he talks about it, uh, Imagine engineering imagination, but in a way, the Everglades are engineered just like that. They're imaginary. So, um, okay, now I'm, I'm dropping this. And this is my final chapter. So I told you I end with slow hope with, uh, I start with Alaska and I end with, um, oh shoot, it's already time to seven. I'm sorry. Um, I end with, with Portland and maybe I just, for the sake of it, I just leave it like this. Uh, so my last chapter is called Traveling into America's Green Future. And I'm looking at novels. I'm looking at satire. Uh, I'm also looking at, this is a, a postcard from the 1940s when uh, the urban city, uh, the, the highway was built through the city and people were sending postcards about it. But today it's a promenade with cyclists and joggers. How did this happen? This was my question. And uh, 
why are people, why has this become the most sustainable city? Why was Portland the first city to pull down its urban highway? Well, I will leave it at that. I won't tell you the answer because I realize that I'm just, uh, history plays a role, images play a role, private initiative backyards play a role, birds play a role, making space for birds, make sure you see birds in the city, changing the environment, creating bioswales plays a role. And so, um, I will drop here because I realize how late it is. And this is my goodbye here. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's part of the slow city versus boom and dust city, like Detroit or a fast forward city like Las Vegas. This is one of my questions. Um, and can we write? Because my, I'm trying to write a history that is neither triumphalist, you know, nature's nation, the inventors of national park, nor declensionist, the end of nature. None of the two it works. You need to see them together. So it's a perspectivism. It's not, I think that it's Nietzsche. And it's maybe not Hegelian. It's a, it's a perspectivist. Um, and um, so with this, I realized that I've, I've just been doing this too, too long. Thank you. Thank you, Christoph, for such a fantastic and inspiring and very rich talk and uh, much food for thought. And uh, we have a few minutes if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, thank you for the talk. Well, can you hear me? Well, thank you for fascinating and um, um, many things to, to think on. So maybe tomorrow we would have a better question. But, um, now I want to ask, I want to come back to the first part, and uh, you were saying about using the right words, uh, machine, robot, and everything. And I was wondering whether uh, in South the word home is uh, in some ways dangerous um, for the fact that um, it can, um, how to say, it has a sense of waiting. For, for some external forces, uh, and so that's this meaning of being sitting and hoping uh, for something to happen and not to actually do something. So it's just on the, uh, if you can maybe go a bit deeper on why did you choose that this word, hope, which has a theological meaning, like the hope and uh, God. And so waiting for some external things to happen and not to do uh, something. Yeah, I, this is a really important question. I, I appreciate it very much. Uh, definitely what is needed is a vision. And hope has something, you know, uh, implies a vision of a, of a better world. For me, the emphasis is on slow, which means that uh, it doesn't happen. It's, it's a vision that is something that doesn't happen overnight, but it doesn't exclude, in fact, in the contrary, it includes, of course, being political. It includes being activist. I mean, it, every story that I'm telling, it doesn't matter whether it's a story of, of London, you needed to, you needed to maybe be shocked to realize, you know, that there are uh, 12,000 people died prematurely after the, after big smog, the big uh, smog yeah. in London. And then you changed the legislation so it became a political story. Even the story of the Taipei architect, it's a story of reworking, you know, it's a story of changing something actively. Hope is a result of this. Hope is not uh, something that happens. I'm not talking. Really, I'm not a latter day Christ uh, visionary. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm somebody who pleads for activism. Uh, but we've talked about activism and, uh, much, and and and, and, uh, and I think it's really important to emphasize this duality to realize that that there is destructive violence on one hand, and to try to find something that can counter. Uh, the destruction and it will take time. That's basically my, my thesis. But I, I realize, uh, what you're saying. And when I presented this before people, there was always a division of people. Some would say, Oh, this is not activist enough. And the others said it's too political. But I, uh, but I think it's exactly the mix. It needs to be some, it needs, we need to be political. Yeah. One more, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, one in the back. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your talk. 
I must confess that I, I am a fan because uh, uh, for my studies, uh, I've been a long time with the book, Natural Disasters, Cultural Responses, your credit book, because I work on botanical actions and uh, emotional responses in the side of the Okay. Uh, in the last year, I started a project about um, if we can uh, interpret uh, um, a pandemic like a natural disaster as a virus and a member of our environment. So I'd like to know if you also started to think about it. I'm not sure whether I understood it. Can you help me? Uh, so if we can interpret a pandemic like a natural disaster. Oh, yes. Okay. This is a difficult question. I mean, I think, first of all, I don't quite believe that natural disasters exist as such. Yeah. Um, it's difficult to define natural disasters in part because natural disasters, uh, is hunger a natural disaster, for instance? I mean, we've, we've often created it. Um, is, uh, is a natural disaster, it, it, we only call it a natural disaster if it happens in our human environment. Let's say a tsunami in the Pacific that nobody notices is not a natural disaster. So the definition is, is, is difficult. I think a natural disaster is something that we, in a way, have some, it's, it's relevant for us when we write about it, I think. It's, we would probably not write about it until there was some human involvement, especially, you know, we're talking about the Anthropocene here. And I think we have taken risks. So also when I talk about the natural disaster, I, just, I think that we've taken risks. We've taken risks. We are in, we, uh, when it comes to pandemic, we definitely have, uh, we're taking risks when, if you don't wear masks, for instance. So I think, um, it's a really good question. Is this a natural disaster? Uh, uh, I like the fact that we don't talk about it as such. I like the fact that we have words to distinguish. I mean, I like the fact that we talk about pandemic, that we have a different vocabulary for that. But yes, it's something that happens in nature that you can, that you can explain biologically or chemically or, um, um, uh, but in, in this case, biologically, and uh, just in brackets, I think biology is, is the discipline that we should focus on much more. Yeah. Medical uh, disciplines are, are, are disciplines that we should focus on much more. So the environmental humanities that focus on uh, uh, health issues are, in my opinion, extremely important because they put our bodies in the center. And uh, what happens to our bodies, to call that a natural disaster is probably the wrong term, but I think to, to understand it as something uh, you know, that is uh, more than ecological, something that is uh, yeah, um, biological and uh, therefore natural, you know, yes, yes. I think that's, yeah. So much.